everybody, welcome back to Retro Modding News, my weekly video where I talk about what's new and upcoming in the world of retro console modding. First up, we have this cool update from the Multisystem Twitter. They are showing off this interesting looking acrylic shell for the Mr. Multisystem. Mr. Multisystem, if you don't know, is sort of like a motherboard that a DE10 Nano can sit on just to kind of make the DE10 Nano a little more user friendly, puts the ports in a little bit better positioning so that you can have a nicer Mr. as well as it's a case for the Mr. If you look at the Mr. Multisystem store right now, they're not actually for sale. Uh, I guess batch three is going to come soon, but the price for the normal 3D printed enclosures is about 45 pounds. I can't imagine that a couple of pieces of acrylic are going to be more expensive than 45 pounds. So this could be an inexpensive way for somebody to build a Mr. Multisystem without having to shell out the 45 pounds for the 3D printed case. They say that it's going to come in a range of colors, so we're just going to have to wait and see more about the price as well as what the other colors are going to look like. Next we have this 3D printed bracket for the Open Xenia mod chip from Dragon Sword Gaming. I know they kind of joked that this is something that nobody asked for, but I do find it annoying how when you plug the Open Xenium here into the socket on the Xbox motherboard, it kind of flops around and it doesn't really give you a solid feeling like it's staying in there. So if this 3D printed bracket can give the Open Xenium chip some support on the bottom so that, you know, it's not going to snap off in your Xbox, then I think this is a sort of must have for anybody who has an Open Xenium. It looks like it clamps the board from the top here and then it has a little leg that kind of hooks into one of the motherboard screws. So this is secured to the motherboard as well as secured around the mod chip. They didn't mention if this is gonna be for sale or if they're just gonna open source it. So I look forward to being able to either get one of these or print one of these myself. Next, we have something that I think a lot of people are gonna be excited about. I've actually been talking about it for a few weeks now. This is that Blue Retro PS1 slash two receiver that I've been talking about, but this is an entire GitHub repository for how to build this entire adapter. And folks, if you're gonna have a GitHub for your project, I think this is the exact way that you should do it. There are two different main sections. There's the case and the Gerbers. The case is the 3D printing files for the shell of the adapter. And the Gerbers are all of the files that you're gonna to need to order a PCB for you to make one of these yourself. And at first you'll notice that the readme is sort of sparse. There aren't many details in here. That's because everything is in the GitHub wiki over here. So if you go to the wiki, there's some nice screenshots of the enclosure, the bill of materials, which is all the electronic components you're gonna to need to order. There's even instructions on how to order one of the PCBs yourself and step-by-step -step instructions for how you can assemble the adapter yourself. I think that the most unfortunate thing about the whole adapter is that you have to use a PS2 controller port to kind of assemble the whole adapter. That's what's actually gonna plug into your console. They're trying to use an authentic PlayStation controller plug so that it's like, the tightest tolerances that you can get. So if that doesn't bother you, then I think this is a really awesome project. I definitely want to build one of these myself. I don't really have a ton of time anymore since I started going back to the office. However, this project is definitely high on my list of things that I wanna build in the future. Next, we have the Sega Genesis Model 3 replacement motherboard. It looks like this is another one of those projects that will completely replace an old game console motherboard. So you're taking some of the chips from the original motherboard, desoldering them from that board and adding them onto a brand new board with some other brand new components. Now, this particular board is for the Genesis Model 3. So it definitely comes with some of the downsides of the Sega Genesis Model 3. Here you see Bob from HRGB asking if there's gonna be Sega Master System or 32X support. And I don't think there's going to be, at least Tian Fong doesn't believe there's gonna be. This is just a straight up replacement motherboard for the Sega Genesis Model 3. I think that the PCB artwork on this is really awesome looking. I mean, it looks like there's this gold down here, gold artwork and dolphins and stuff. I mean, this is one of the nicest looking PCB artworks that I've seen in a while. There's no real information about whether or not this is gonna be a product for sale or if this is gonna be an open source project. So we'll just have to wait and see what becomes of this project. Next, we have an interesting update from Mr. Add-ons about a PlayStation 1 Mr. Snack Adapter. Snack adapters allow you to use real controllers with your Mr. at basically an electrical level. The signals from the snack adapters can go right into the Mr. Cores, and the Mr. Core can access those signals directly without having any sort of like USB translation layer. There are some interesting features specifically with this PlayStation 1 snack adapter. You'll see what looks like a composite video port on the back here, as well as a DC input. I believe the composite video port is so that you can use PlayStation 1 light guns 
with this snack adapter natively. So if you're using a CRT TV and you have a PlayStation light gun, you can use that through the snack adapter. Mr. Addon said he tested a bunch. So GunCon, Hyper Blaster, Micro Uzi, I don't even know, I don't even know what that is. So there's a bunch of different accessories that can work with this adapter. Also that DC input is to allow controllers to use rumble. It seems that the five volts that normally comes through the snack adapters is not powerful enough for the 7.5 to eight volts that the rumble motors need. So that external DC input can be used to power those rumble motors. Really cool accessory for the Mister. Allow you to use a whole bunch of different PlayStation accessories with your Mister. No word on pricing or anything for this, but I'll be sure to retweet it when Mister Addons announces it. Next, we have this updated Dreamcast VMU from DreamMods.net. They're calling it the VM2, like a sequel to the VMU. It has a bunch of features that the original VMU doesn't have and kind of modernizes it a little bit. So let's just go ahead and look at the list of improvements down here. Looks like there is a new LCD backlit screen. It has a higher screen resolution. It has a micro SD card slot so you can save your save games or VMU mini games onto your SD card. If you're not using the SD card, it has three times as much storage as a, an original VMU. Instead of coin batteries, it has an internal LiPo battery. I'm not really sure about using LiPo batteries. I'm not sure about the longevity of them. Most cell phones have LiPos inside of them. How long does a cell phone battery last? Anyways, that's beside the point. We have external charging, so you can charge that battery with a micro USB connector. It can also connect to a PC, so I'm guessing that you can connect to that SD card so you can pull the files off of the SD card and put them on your computer. And it looks like there's some sort of a custom memory management UI that you can go into and move stuff probably from the SD card to the main memory. I don't really know that much about the Dreamcast or the VMU, but this seems like a pretty cool product. They actually have a part down here on the bottom of the page if you have any feedback here, you can leave your name and a comment and maybe they might take some of your comments and improve the product some more. I just can't go a single video without Mike Chi dropping some huge bomb. And he must know that I record these videos on Friday too, because he just dropped this about less than an hour ago. So this is still in heavy development, but Mike Chi is showing us a render here of all the different video inputs that the RetroTink 4K is gonna have. He said that this might change over the development cycle of this product, but it gives us an interesting look about the direction that he's going to head with this new scaler. So let's start from the top and kind of work around and we'll talk about the different ports on this thing. So I'm assuming this far left port is a USB type C port. That's probably for power and maybe how you're gonna do the firmware updates. We've got two HDMI ports. One of them is obviously gonna be the video output that's gonna to go to your TV. The other one is actually an HDMI input. He hasn't talked yet about the features of an HDMI input yet. This looks like a Toslink or optical audio, probably output. Next, we have four HD15 ports. These are the same types of ports that you find on a VGA cable. There's actually a fifth one in the front here. So that's five total HD15 inputs. These five universal Universal HD 15 ports will support RGHV, normal RGB sync, RGB sync on green, YPBPR or component video, S video, and composite. So all five of those ports will support any of those input types as long as you have the correct dongle. Then if we move around the corner here, we have a SCART input and SCART also can take in normal RGB sync, sync on green, component video, S video, and composite. So it's almost like the SCART input is another one of those HG15 inputs. Then we go around and we can see a composite video input. We see an S video input, and then we have a right and left audio. I'm not sure what that is for. And then we see in the front here, an SD card slot. So right away, I can tell you that Jeff Chen is super excited right now. He loves VGA and HD15 cables and making adapters out of them. My initial reaction to this is maybe some people might be frustrated that you now need adapters from that HD15 port to whatever style of cable that you have, either a SCART input or a component cable input, on top of the price for those already pretty expensive cables. But Mike said he went with these HD15 ports because they're pretty robust and it's a lot more compact than both component with the three RCA ports as well as a SCART input. So he's going this direction in an effort to make the device smaller instead of really big. Really cool render. I'm excited to hear more about this device, even though I don't think it's gonna be available for a pretty long time, probably not even this year. It's just kind of interesting to see the designs that he kind of comes up with to solve issues for retro modding and retro scalers. That's it for this week. If you wanna suggest a new story to me, follow me on Twitter or join the Discord. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.